focus of the talk I'm going to give tonight is, is, is on caribou. I'm a hydrologist, so uh, the reason I got into this area was primarily because of work we'd done in the tundra, uh, looking at how we could use satellites and passive microwave radiation to uh, determine how much snowpack uh, water equivalent was on, the, was on the ground. And the reason for doing that was that for, for a couple of reasons. One is that um, the tundra is a big place and snow is a very important part of the hydro hydrological cycle. Um, it represents somewhere between, well, depending on where you are in the tundra, 40 to 50% of, of the annual precipitation. But the snow melt period represents somewhere in the order of 80 to 90% of the annual runoff. So it, it makes for a very important component. And it also affects carbon cycling, it affects uh, permafrost distribution, it affects all sorts of things. So its, its influence is more or less ubiquitous in the north, as you well know. Most of you live here. So the reason for looking at caribou was simply that we'd finished the study on, on uh, near Daring Lake on the tundra and we worked out a, an equation which, which helped us significantly extrapolate what we'd done to other parts of the, of the tundra. So, and the other reason for doing this was that global circulation models or global change, global change models, climate change models, um, have several components in them, of course, and one of them which is critical to understanding the exchange of energy between high latitudes and, north, and, and low latitudes is the, is the actual uh, algorithms that look after uh, the distribution of snow and how long it stays on the uh, ground. Because of its high reflective capabilities, it's very important in terms of surface energy budgets. So with the work we did, uh, it serves to be able to uh, provide a check on these algorithms that global circulation models do. Okay, so uh, while we were doing this work, we recognized from talking to people in Yellowknife um, that the caribou herds across Canada, most of them were decreasing at a rather alarming rate. And so we decided that we would uh, apply our knowledge of snow and, and how satellite imagery data can be used to detect changes in snow to see if, w if we could somehow quantify the impact of snowfall and s the snowpack on, on caribou and whether it was part of the reason why caribou numbers are decreasing. I'd like to also acknowledge these co-authors, uh, Jennifer Hickman's in the room, uh, Roy Judas is a conservation officer with ENR, in uh, Wekbati, where most of this work take, took place. Uh, Jan Adamczewski is a ungulate biologist in Yellowknife and has been providing us with a, an awful lot of information. Uh, Sarah Elser is with the Wekizi Land and Water Board. Uh, and Lebo Wang and Chris Dirksen are remote sensors who work at Downsview Environment Canada. So this group uh, sort of brings the expertise uh, needed to uh, achieve and accomplish the objectives that we have here. And to acknowledge the people of Wekwedi, the Cumulative Impacts Monitoring Program, Environment Canada, and Environment and Natural Resources. Okay, the first slide is something you're very familiar with. It basically shows the obvious, and you're all aware of this. But what's alarming here, of course, is, is how quickly things are dropping. So this was, this was really the, the focus here. If you, if you are a, trying to obtain your food through the snowpack six to seven months or five to six, seven months of the year. Um, and the snowpack is changing with formation of ice crusts and, and snow crusts, ice lenses, then the energy required to make it through the snowpack is probably fairly significant. And perhaps it's part of the reason why uh, there's phys physiological stress on caribou and perhaps that tied in with everything else is a reason why their numbers are dropping. So our objective was to determine if changes in the snowpack play a role in increasing stress on caribou. Now, as I said, there are several herds in, in northern Canada that are decreasing, notably the George River herd in Labrador, which has gone from somewhere around 750,000 down to about uh, 10 to 20 percent of its former size. And of course, if we go circumpolar in distribution, many of the herds around the world are following the same sort of pattern that the Bathurst caribou herd has. So why is this? So we, we take an approach here and there's four things uh, that I'll cover in this talk. Okay, the first one is with respect to structural changes. Are, are these occurring within the subarctic snowpack? Um, will these occur in the future with increasing frequency? 
How do we measure with confidence that changes are occurring and what tools do we use to assess that? And then the last slide really talks about our approach. Once we look at all these things, how much confidence do we have in these tools? And taking that forward, um, how do we apply those and what confidence would we have in the end result? So these are the factors that play a role in terms of um, depletion of, of, of caribou herd. Now, many of you are more familiar with these than I am. This is what I want to focus on today, okay? So climate. Climate does tie into forest fires. Um, Jennifer and I have seen that it certainly ties into wolf predation, or we think it does. And it probably ties into disease as well. So all of these things are interrelated. Um, the snowpack, as I said, is sort of ubiquitous in many ways in terms of the tundra and its effect on everything. Now, as an extreme example, uh, to sort of underline where we're going with this, is that in October of 2003 on Banks Island, there was a very significant um, uh, rain on ice event, or rain on snow event, which, which created a, quite a significant ice lens on the soil, on the, on the vegetation that the muskox were trying to uh, eat. Uh, what happened was the temperatures, uh, normal, normal winter temperatures occurred and in October for about five days there was sort of a light drizzle, uh, nothing heavy and after that the temperatures dropped like a rock and evidently what happened was that drizzle sort of made its way through the 15 or 20 centimeters of snow, formed a, a, a reasonably thick ice lens in the, over the soil, over the vegetation and of course the, the, climate, uh, the weather didn't change again and through the winter it remained cold and 20,000 muskox died because they couldn't access their food. Okay, so there's an extreme event. And that's not something that's going on in the subarctic uh, boreal forest right now, but it's something that might happen in the future. And what I'll do with part of the talk is to demonstrate why that is happening and what's happening with the climate to perhaps encourage that sort of shift in, in, in what's happening to um, the caribou. So, I guess a, a question that is raised because animals usually have periods of high and low population trends, and we're all familiar with that. It's driven naturally, and so what makes this decline different than other declines? And whether, is this going to be different, or will these caribou recover? What's happening with the situation? In order to answer that, there's a few slides that sort of address this. And, and so what we have here now is, is the annual mean October to September uh, temperature anomaly. In other words, this is uh, the, for the 1900 to more or less the present time. Uh, this would be the, the average temperature. So given, given the changes and fluctuations here, what's, what's happening? So how do these anomalies occur? Well, basically what this is telling us is that between 60 and 90 degrees north that you see here, uh, the temperatures are, are, are changing at a much faster rate than they are globally here. And we're all familiar with that because, of course, in the subarctic and Arctic systems, uh, climate change is, 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 is more pronounced. And we'll, we'll, we'll basically talk a little bit about that and one of the explanations that, that might be uh, tied into um, global circulation models and, and the global atmospheric exchange of energy. So I'm just, I have two diagrams here. They're sort of theoretical in nature, but when we're looking at changes to the snowpack, um, we have a simple uh, graph here on the x-axis. We have October to September. Uh, this is more or less when the snowpack starts to form, and of course it, it builds up and then it melts again. So the brackets here indicate periods of time when the probability of changes in the snowpack are most pronounced, okay? So this is the fall period when the snow is building up. The Banks Island example is an extreme of that. But of course, it can happen anywhere, really. So we're interested in this period, usually between the two brackets, that it's cold enough that um, probably the probability of changes in the structure, aside from building up the snowpack in terms of depth, is probably fairly remote. And then, of course, in the spring, when the sun has risen higher in the atmosphere, it's pretty intense. Even at temperatures of minus 5, minus 6, you can form significant snow crusts here. And we see that today in the late winter, and these aren't snow crusts that sort of disappear in the afternoon and then come back again in the evening because it cools down. These are snow crusts that form well before that temperature fluctuation dictates that sort of pattern. So if we look at the future, we're looking at something like this. Now, depending on which global model you look at, and uh, the Canadian global models do predict an increase in snowfall here, uh, and others say that it's going to be a little less, and I'll show you some data to back up 
this for sure. So what we have now, if we compare the sort of previous scenario oops, to this, is that we either have less or more snow, but the important thing is that the uh, growing season has increased and the period of time when the snowpack is on the ground has decreased, okay? And also the brackets get a little wider. So the proportion of the snow year that's being affected by the high probability of changes to the snow pack are, 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 are relatively higher, okay? This is from Phil Marsh. This is some data that uh, he showed me from Inuvik. Uh, this, is, this is snow on the ground, so it's not snowpack water equivalent, which we usually measure, but this is just snow depth. And the blue color here, 1957 and 1985, well, you can see the distribution. And this is a more recent uh, period of time, so 86 to 2012. So visually, you can see that things have changed somewhat, okay? These are fairly long data sets, so we'd have some confidence that probably the changes we're seeing there are real. If we look at uh, globe snow databases, this is a Finnish uh, database that's based on satellite data. Uh, it's, uh, it's compiled with the help of Environment Canada and their algorithms. And I'll get to that a little later, but what we have here going from 1979 when the satellite that can sense these things was put up until fairly recently, this is about 2012 at the end there, this is snowpack water equivalent. So if we take the snowpack and we melt it, that's how much standing water there would be on the land at any time. So what we see here, aside from 91, 92, and there's quite an extreme uh, amount of snow, uh, basically it's flatlined. So we don't see any increase in this. Now these uh, samples were taken from pixels all over the winter foraging grounds of the Bathurst caribou herd, okay? Just randomly picked. We just wanted to see what, what sort of uh, pattern we'd see there in terms of total snowpack water equivalent. Phil, also, Phil Marsh also provided me with this. Uh, this is the uh, June measurement of the aerial extent of snow in the uh, um, northern hemisphere, okay? So keep in mind there's, there's error bars attached to these estimates, but this is satellite data, so it's, this is extent, okay? This isn't how much is actually there, this is simply extent. So this goes from the late 60s up to the current time. And of course, there's a rough line. This, I think it's either red or green line drawn here that shows the obvious decrease. You can see that visually. So we're seeing some changes in the snowpack that are probably important here, indicating there's a, a much warmer winter probably. If we look ahead, uh, winter and summer going 2016 to 35, 46 to 65, and into the, uh, the next century. Um, we have a, quite a significant increase in temperature. There's this, the color scheme there. So increasing, this is in degrees Celsius from 0.2 up to, or ne, sorry, uh, changing cooler or warmer, okay? So this is uh, about one degree. This is uh, 10 and 11 degrees there. So you can see that uh, by the winters of 2081 to 2100, uh, there's significant parts of the, uh, of the globe that are gonna have extreme warm, warming compared to what we have now, summers not as much. So in other words, as we, as we move forward in time, at least the models predict that, uh, that the conditions that are gonna govern the snowpack and just structural changes in the snowpack are going to increase to a point where we probably would see the second um, slide that I showed you with respect to the period of time influenced by changes in the snowpack would be much greater. Okay, now the reason I'm putting this in is that I wanted to talk a little bit about the, the variability that we see here in the blue line, and that is indicating sort of temperature changes between 60 and 90 degrees north. So between basically the territorial border and the pole. And we'll go back to that. But first of all, uh, when we're looking at warming in the north, and specifically what's happened to the Arctic Ocean, they've noticed since about uh, 2001, a change in atmospheric conditions. And for, before I get to that, I'll talk about one of the primary uh, teleconnections, atmospheric teleconnections that has been identified by climatologists over the last many years. And this ties into the amplitude of the polar jet stream. And the, this is referred to as the Arctic Oscillation. And typically, um, they identify this as when there's a low pressure system over the Azores and a high pressure system over the pole and the positive phase is the reverse of that. 
But what's important here is not so much the, the, the stationary high and low pressure systems, which give some indication as to these different conditions in the globe. What's really important here is the difference between the meridional flow here, this high amplitude wave, and the low amplitude wave that we see here. The reason why we have this high amplitude wave here is because of the surface temperature differences between the low latitudes and the high latitudes. And the surface temperature differences dictate what's happening in the atmosphere. If you have a very cold atmosphere like we do here, the top of the troposphere, which is the lowest portion of the atmosphere closest to Earth at the tropopause, is relatively low. It's somewhere between eight, seven and eight kilometers above where we are right now, or above sea level. If we go down to the equator, uh, because the equator doesn't change temperature too much, the tropopause is somewhere around 16, 17 kilometers, so roughly twice as high. So what's happening then when you have that extreme difference is when you go at sea level at high latitude and low latitude and you go up in elevation, the pressure differences start to be quite significantly different. In other words, you have more atmospheric mass over the equator at a site, say, four kilometers than you have over the pole. So what we've created here is basically a high pressure system here and a low pressure system here in terms of the atmospheric mass. Mother Nature doesn't like that imbalance and we, we create a sort of a, a, a pressure gradient force which forces air movement northward. And it, because of Coriolis, it's deflected to the right. So what happens here with respect to the northern hemisphere is we have a structure of continents, oceans, continents, oceans. So we have very different surfaces that heat up and cool off at very different rates. So in the winter, we know that the continents cool off very quickly. We also know that the Atlantic Ocean, in this case, cools down very slowly because the specific heat of water is about four times that of land. So, so what's happening here is as the oceans cool off, it's still pretty warm here. So if we go up to my example of air pressure differences, the air pressure difference over the continent, say, in a transect like this, is much different than it is over the Atlantic Ocean. And that, what that does, it means, as when we go back to the continental example with that pressure difference, in the winter, because the pressure difference is so significant, the, 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 the tendency for the, the air mass moving north to, to be deflected to the right is much further south than it is over the ocean. Over the ocean, because the pressure differences are much less, that, that mass tends to move north further and then it's deflected. So basically you have a structure here which guarantees most of the time a very high amplitude wave. The important thing about the high amplitude wave is you create high pressure systems here and low pressure systems here. So these synoptic high and low pressure systems move across, in this case, North America. And what they are is basically a three-dimensional exchange of energy. Okay? If it wasn't for these form the formation of these synoptic highs and lows, the high latitudes above 35 degrees north would cool off about 90 degrees in three months. So that exchange of energy is very important, obviously, to this part of the world. The other example that we have here is, 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 a less, is, is flow which has a very low amplitude wave. It's, it's almost flatlined. If it was flatlined, we'd call it zonal flow. And obviously, the same mechanism that we talked about here is not going to be invoked here. Because you, the, the reason why we form high pressure systems here is because the amplitude of the wave is so high, it, it basically creates a mechanism for a, a anticyclonic flow and cyclonic flow here. It does not happen in here. So without that high and low pressure system forming here, which it doesn't here, the exchange of energy is very low. So this cools off. This is when you get very cold winters in the, in, in, in the territories. Okay. All right, so what does it have to do with this? Well, if you look at the frequency here, and I didn't do any real analysis on this, I just did some counts and things like that, it seems to me that the deviations that we see here are tied into the oscillation that we see with respect to the period when we have a negative and a positive Arctic oscillation. And if we look at the pattern of the Arctic oscillation here, this goes from 1950, up to about 2000, um, well, the end of 2014. So this is fairly recent. And you can see this fluctuation. We obviously haven't got time to, to, to compare the two, but I did a rough calculation of this, and it seems that the negative and positive phases tie in reasonably nicely to, uh, wherever it was, to the, to, the, to the ups and downs that we see in this blue line here. 
So that sort of makes sense in a sense, because if you have a high amplitude wave, and that's, that's responsible for exchanging energy and making the Northwest Territories, in this case, or high latitudes, somewhat warmer, then you'd probably see this, this upper peak here. If it goes the other way, then it probably drops a little bit. Remember, this is a period of years along here. And the frequency of, of the change that we're talking about can be certainly much less than years. The other thing that happened in 2001 was uh, uh, NOAA in the States discovered a, a rather interesting uh, addition to the teleconnection family. They're referred to as the Arctic Dipole. And the Arctic Dipole forms when we have a high pressure system over the Canadian side of the pole and a low pressure system over the Eurasian side of the pole. And what happens here is because of the way this is set up and the way the winds are generated in this pattern right here, is that we start to pull up warm air from the Pacific Ocean, which of course gets into the high Arctic latitudes, and it pushes out cold air over the North Atlantic. So we have a mechanism here which starts to accentuate heating of the high latitudes. And it's thought that the formation of this Arctic dipole was really created in around 2001, it was the first time they noticed it, and it's sort of tied in empirically to the point in time when the ice over the Arctic Ocean started to break up and the period of time when there was more open water was, was much longer. And of course the albedo of ocean water is much different than snow. So it's absorbing more radiation during the summer and of course it's absorbing and it's giving more radiation back. So it made sense that you have something new happening if you have a huge mass of, or a huge area like that which is giving off heat, okay? So tied into this. So what happens with the climate? We're back, this is near Wekwati, this shot. We get warmer winters, shorter winters. We have more snow or less snow. Ice lenses, snow crust, these things are starting to change because of the fact that the system's warming up. I just put this on here because I, and I put the question marks here because of the sort of direct tie-ins and I think the only one I'm gonna focus on right now would be the direct tie-in to forest fire. But if we look at the, the history of forest fires in the Northwest Territories, it's, uh, this goes back, I believe, to 1965. Um, obviously, it's, it's, and there's the tree line. You can sort of see it nicely. But um, what happens here, of course, in terms of caribou and snow, well, if you have a low snowpack, it's been shown in many studies that you have less water to recharge the soil. The trees get drier much earlier, and of course the probability of forest fire increases. So um, in terms of the effects of forest fire on caribou, I mean, and the effect of snow on forest fires, there's, there's the connection there, and of course the connection between to caribou is the fact that some of these fires are very intense fires, especially some of these that happened last year. There's Yellowknife, and, and this just shows the southern part of that. But when you lose close to four million hectares or so of, of, of land, many of them hot fires, you're gonna lose the, the primary food source of, of caribou as well. So if you, if you go back and, and sort of compare all of these sites and you're able to go through remote sensing and determine the degree to which the lichen has been removed by fire, um, then you can start to eliminate sites that the caribou couldn't possibly go to because there's nothing to eat there. It takes f around a half century for the lichen in an intense fire to grow back to a point where it's something that the caribou will, will eat again. So obviously as the frequency of forest fires increase tied into snowfall and other issues, uh, you are slowly reducing the potential uh, areas that caribou can survive in. Okay, so um, moving along here, this is just a diagram, it looks like a big triangle, but we have the calving grounds. This is sort of the area where they shift back and forth. And this is roughly the winter foraging grounds, which covers an area of about a quarter million um, square kilometers. Now, they're obviously not everywhere in here in any given winter. And if we look at this thing, and you probably can't tell much from where you're sitting, but <coughs> uh, one of the students just put this quickly together. We looked at the distribution of caribou in the Bathurst herd from 2005 to 2013. So these colors, which I can't tell anything about because I'm colorblind, tell you something about where they are. This is approximately where Wekwetty is right there. And so you can see that Wekwetty is sort of in the center part of uh, their distribution for most years, at least on the record we have here. So the question is, how do you, how do you get out there and um, 
and sample. And do we, you know, do we count on field work? Well, obviously, it's a big area. You can't go everywhere. And you have to be out there frequently. And, and it's pretty cold. And so that's sort of uh, a non sequitur. And if you count on weather stations to give you information, again, remember, we're dealing with an area which is a quarter million square kilometers. And we have uh, at, uh, at Gameti, Wati, and Wekwedi, sorry about the, the slide, but we're dealing with a very large area, and we're not sure how far we can extrapolate the data from those weather stations to have any confidence that, that really what's going on, say, at Wekwedi is, is, is occurring through a larger area, okay? So the only thing that's, that we're left to is, is using satellite data, and this, of course, goes back to our time at Daring Lake when we used the Special Sensing Microwave Imager to relate to what is on the ground in terms of snowfall, snowpack water equivalents. This is a composite of the information that you can get from the satellite. It's a snowfall here. There's snow on the ice in the Arctic Ocean here. Obviously, this is midwinter. There's, there's uh, Wekwati there, and we're down here somewhere, here. And uh, there's Greenland, just to orient yourselves a little bit. So it can give you a pretty uh, comprehensive idea of what's going on in terms of snowpack and ice coverage on a daily basis. Okay, so this is produced every day. And you can get access to that reasonably easily. In fact, they, they, it does two scans a day. So for every small area you see there, data is coming in more or less continuously. So one of the issues with pa pa using passive microwave radiation, of course, that's what we're measuring. So remember that anything warmer than minus 273 degrees Celsius emits radiation. And so the Earth is emitting radiation continuously, and it emits it in the microwave band. And so the, the, the radiometers that are set up on the satellite are able to detect specific frequencies, wavelengths, uh, emitting from the ground. And because of two things, one is the large area, uh, the, well, first of all, when you're, when you're actually measuring the radiation coming off the ground, there's not a lot coming off the ground. So you need a fairly large area to pick up a signal that's statistically significant. If it was a very small pixel, this one's 25 by 25 kilometers. But if it was much less than that, you couldn't really assess the signal with any confidence. So you wouldn't really be picking up anything. The other thing is that the, um, I don't know if I can show you this quickly. This is the sensor right here. It's blown up a little bit. This antenna here is fairly small. It's only about like this. And if you look at the, if you, if you look at the efficiency of picking up these relatively long wavelengths from the small antenna, uh, there are issues with that too. So that also means you need a bigger surface area to collect energy from. Okay, so, so I s I've said this already, we won't bother repeating that. Uh, and that the satellite measures microwaves in different frequencies, and these frequencies are all important for different things, okay? So the frequencies that we use are a sort of a long, longer wave frequency and a shorter wave frequency. And the reason for that is that if we used really short wave frequencies, the atmosphere would be, there's all sorts of interference in the atmosphere from snow crystals, ice crystals, etc., that would be picked up by that. At the end of the other end of the spectrum, it's not that useful for what we're looking at. But what we're interested in is a, is a longer wave and a shorter wavelength. Okay, so we have radiometers on board that will pick up those specific wavelengths. And the reason for that is that as we, as the as the passive microwave emissions come through the snowpack, they're altered, and we want to pick up that alteration. So there's two things that that we can pick up from the. Uh, satellite, one is we can quantify the snowpack water equivalents by the difference between the emissions of short wave and long wave. And the second thing, we can detect periods of time when ice lenses are formed. And you have to remember too that if we're picking this up in a satellite, uh, a pixel, which is 25 by 25 kilometers, so 625 kilometers, that the effects of climate um, have to be fairly uniform through the pixel or at least covering 60 to 75 percent of the pixel if you're going to pick up anything, okay? If it's a small portion of the pixel, then you won't pick up anything, okay? So there are limitations on that. So in terms of quantifying uh, the energy coming off snowpack, first of all, we refer to it as brightness temperature. And brightness temperature isn't the temperature of the snowpack, okay? 
it's, it, has to, it belongs to uh, physics, and the, the equation is here. Okay? So we take into account things like the temperature of the black body, bright, the uh, Planck's constant, uh, the Boltzmann constant, and the speed of light, etc., etc. So you can basically calculate the energy being emitted at any given time. And we calculate the energy from 37 gigahertz, which is the shorter wavelength, and 19 gigahertz, which is the longer wavelength. The principle is simply this, is that as, snow as the snow is building up, the shorter wavelengths are attenuated in the snowpack, okay, up to a certain point. And once the snowpack gets really thick, then the snowpack starts to emit energy again. So basically the relationship between the two is a quadratic equation, which means that you're, you're, you're losing, the brightness temperature's reducing, and then it's increasing again. Okay, so a simple example here, we're, we're looking at the ratio between the, the brightness temperature of the short wave and the long wave radiation. So the satellite's picking this up, and as the snow builds up, which is indicated by the increasing depth of the blue line, that the ratio between the two decreases, as indicated by the width, is that blue? Okay, the width of the blue arrow, okay, so, so at a certain point in time, you know, the satellite's picking this every day, and of course it, it, it's picking up the ratio between these two. So you calculate the brightness temperature of, the both, of both of them, and you subtract 37 minus 19 gigahertz, and that gives you a value of brightness temperature of the snowpack. Okay? So as you lose energy coming out of the snowpack, the snowpack appears to be getting colder and colder and colder. Okay? So that's the first thing. So that gives you some idea of snowpack water equivalents. And I'll, I'll get to the ground truthing in a minute. This is the equation that we, we determined from the tundra snowpack at Daring Lake. It's a quadratic equation. We sampled there from 2003 to 2009. And we were fortunate that each year had a different snowpack. So it nicely fit into um, uh, forming the equation. So there's the two parts of the equation here that you can determine the snowpack water equivalents from. Right. Okay, so the second thing that is important here, and it's certainly important in terms of caribou, um, because it, you know, when we first started thinking about this, we thought, well, maybe they're looking for thinner snowpacks, so it's easier to get to the food, and the deeper snowpacks would be more effort. But it turns out that they, from the data we've looked at so far, that it's actually the deeper snowpacks they go for. They leave the shallow stuff alone. And the reason probably for that, according to Jan Adam Chesky, is potentially the, the wolves have a tougher time in the deeper snow. Okay, so that makes some sense. Okay, so we look at the other side here, and that has to do with how do we use this system to detect formation of, of ice lenses. Okay, so a couple of things about the, the physics of snow. I guess, first of all, um, the snowpack usually is made up of dry snow. And sometimes when things melt, of course it's spring, and atypically during the snow year, um, the, what's called the dielectric constant of of, of water, liquid water, is quite different than that of, of, of dry snow. And the difference is I've shown here, it's about 83 for um, liquid water, it's about 3 for, for, for dry snow. And, and basically what this does is when you have liquid water in a snowpack, the microwaves are, are, are absorbed readily, but the liquid water gives off microwaves readily as well. So what happens if we have a thaw? We need, it takes 1% of the snowpack, roughly 1% snowpack water equivalent to change the entire emission characteristics of the snowpack. So if we have a snowpack that's somewhere in the order of 40 centimeters depth and a density of 0.15 grams per cubic centimeter, and we're looking at 1% of that, it comes out to about six millimeters of water is all that's necessary in a 40 centimeter snowpack to change the entire signature that the satellite's picking up. So the scenario is this, that um, today, like outside, today the temperature goes up to five degrees Celsius, and tonight it drops to minus 15. So during the daytime, you're creating liquid water in the surface of the pack. And as I said, the, the satellite passes every site twice a day. So the first pass, well, the second pass in a day is, is in the early evening, and the first pass in the morning is in the early morning. And so, so what's happening then is, is that first pass, you probably still have liquid water in the pack. So what's happening is this, the satellite gives the data that tells us there's no snowpack there anymore. Two days previously, you're picking up snowpack. Now there's no snowpack. It freezes again, and now we have a snowpack again. So when we look at the data, the day-to-day -day data, when we're missing a snowpack, when all of a sudden the emissivity characteristics change, 
we know we have a high probability of ice lens formation. So we basically just check that off. So we look at the spring, we look at the fall, and occasionally, and we use the weather data from Gametti, Wati, and, and Wekwati to, to find periods of time when the probability of changes are very high. So that helps us narrow the gap, okay? So that gives us a pretty high probability that ice formation has happened in the system. Now, the other thing that the satellite can do is it can pick up what's called a polarized um, uh, frequencies, wavelengths coming towards the satellite. So it, it's equipped with, with the ability to pick up what's referred to as the vertical and horizontal polarized emissions coming from the snow or from anything for that matter. So when we talk about polarization, if we, if we have water which has a high dielectric constant, the, the, the potential for, for emissions through water are such that it'll, it'll change the, the, the type of emission that's coming out and, and rapidly polarize the type of emission. So what this means is, is that when you're looking at this wavelength coming out, it's an electromagnetic current okay, that's coming towards you. And what happens is, in, in, in this case, um, the red one here, this is the electric part of that. And this part in white is the magnetic part. So they're polarized, okay? And as they come to you, what we're interested in is, is picking up the electric uh, curve here. So that would be the vertical polarization of, say, whatever frequency we're looking at. And this is opposite. This is horizontal polarization, okay? So this is the electric curve here in the blue. So when we're picking up this stuff, whether it's polarized vertically or horizontally depends on what the formation is in the ice pack. So when a horizontal ice lens forms in the snowpack, we start to pick up a horizontal polarization of both the 19 and the 37 gigahertz. Okay, so it's very pronounced. So the satellite is equipped to pick up both of those, okay? So we can discern not only we get the, the entire energy coming out at 19 and 37 gigahertz, we're able to parse the 19 gigahertz and the 37 gigahertz, and it gives us more information. It now tells us that we probably have, if, you know, if there's a, a, a bridge in the, sorry, in the 37 gigahertz, uh, sorry, 37 gigahertz horizontal polarization, we probably have a nice lens forming, okay? And what happens too in terms of the brightness temperature is the brightness temperature will all of a sudden change in terms of say the 19 um, gigahertz, if we have horizontal polarization at 19 gigahertz, the brightness temperature of the snowpack changes by about 40 degrees Kelvin immediately. So now we have different ways and means of determining what's happening in that 625 square kilometers. Remember though that part of the reason we would see ice lens formation, it may be the intensity of radiation hitting slopes or, you know, and it may be quite preferential to a certain slope and aspect. And so that may only cover 10 or 20 percent of your pixel. So you're never going to pick anything up with the satellite. They may be important areas where the caribou are feeding, but we'll never find that with the satellite detection. Okay. So are we sure it works? Well, this is we go back to the field again and uh, taking snow cores with uh, an Environment Canada snow core and we take many measurements of depth. More measurements of depth than density. We multiply the density times the depth and we get snowpack water equivalent. Um, we only take one usually core because the densities are pretty uniform throughout, certainly on a lake, less so on the land. And we take 30 depth measurements and multiply, you just take the average depth measurement because depth varies quite significantly. Um, again, more so on the land, but it does on the lake as well. Okay, so we're ground truthing pixels. And just as an example, there's Wekwati here. Um, this is one of the pixels here. It so happens that Wekwati is, is located right at the cross section of four pixels, one here, one here, one here, and one here. So we do two transects, one here and one here. This just shows you where we sample. So we cut diagonally across the pixel and we sample proportionate to the amount of land area and lake area, okay? So once we, once we do that, then we have a reasonable confidence that the, that the data that we're collecting is somewhat representative of, of what's here. So we go back a few times a year and then we compare that to the algorithm and find out that the algorithm and the data that we have are somewhat different. And we can, we, can, we can correct for that difference. But we would expect that as we go from pixel to pixel to pixel that the proportion of, of lake area to land area is going to change. 
So there's slight deviation from the relationship that we, we have in the algorithm. And the reason we do ground truthing is to try and correct that. Okay. Our last slide basically just talks about what we do here. So first of all, we have to evaluate forest fire sites. We have to determine whether the growth of lichen there is, is really something that's still coming on or whether the fire that went through there is not that hot and there's still a good uh, patch of lichen for caribou to eat so we can sort of eliminate areas of the territories that are probably uh, places where the caribou will go or they won't. We use the data that the uh, ENR has collected, the uh, wildlife division, uh, that sort of daily data on the movement of caribou that have collars and there's only 20 that have collars so there's obviously a bit of confidence in whether the fact the collared caribou are where everybody else is so to do that you can do a, a nearest neighbor analysis of where the collared caribou are and you make the assumption that the caribou are relative to that distribution so if they're all here you make the assumption that probably the rest of them are fairly close if they're here and here and here then of course the distribution is going to be much wider so then you, when you're sampling your sites, you have to pay attention to where they are and where the probability of the rest of the caribou are. So uh, there's a little bit of math involved in that, but it's not a big issue. But you have some, you, because you're dealing with thousands of pixels, okay, each pixel is 625 square kilometers, and we're dealing with 250,000 uh, uh, square kilometers of land where they potentially are. Probably about a quarter to an eighth of that is where they are in any given winter, but still it's a big number. So in order to discern whether, in fact, the caribou are going to areas where there's ice lenses or not, you have to be quite careful in terms of how you select those pixels. Now, quantifying the snow condition using ArcGIS is much easier. We can do everything at once. So the data I said we have before comes from um, a Finnish uh, data set, which is aided by Environment Canada. So and using ArcGIS, we can basically look at all the pixels in the Northwest Territories at once. So basically, it enables us to go day by day by day to see what changes are occurring. It's a little more complicated because we're looking at the uh, polarization of the 37 or 19 gigahertz, and we're looking at the difference between the two. There's a lot of data involved there. So spatially and temporally, it becomes a complex spatial problem in terms of simply analyzing the data. And it's something we really didn't think about before we got into this project, but with the help of uh, Colin Robertson, who's a spatial modeler at, at Laurier, uh, it'll make life a lot easier for us. So, of course, we need to quantify the snow conditions, given what I just said, and employ the right software to discern patterns over time. I think that's it. <laughs>